Okay, so I'm going to introduce you to our next speaker. Uh, so I've known her probably for a few years now, at least. Uh, we've kind of met around the uh, conference circuit, and she's always doing kind of interesting sessions, so I, I assume this one's going to be interesting as well. I assume that. Uh, and uh, she's been working with uh, companies applying lean principles from any size company, from startups all the way to very large organizations. Uh, and on our conference journey, we, we've met on multiple occasions. We've never actually met in either of our hometowns, our home bases, uh, but now she is in mine, so let's welcome uh, her for that, uh, for coming here. So now, I went to all the speakers at the speaker dinner. I said, is there anything special you want me to do for your introduction? And, and everyone just said, nah, whatever, except for Kat. Kat requested a, a, a fight introduction, so we're gonna, we're gonna do a little bit of a fight introduction here, which will give her a uh, round of applause uh, afterwards. So here, speaking on exploring and orchestrating orchestra organizational change, hailing all the way from Phoenix, Arizona, in the United States of America, we have Kat, the conference crusher, the Bitcoin belittler, the bringer of hiking hilarity, Swatel. I ask for that introduction at close to every conference that I go to, and I think that it speaks to how unique this conference is, that I actually got it. So, thank you, Todd. Yes, so this is my topic, and this is me. I'm going to do a disclaimer right now. Um, yesterday, we saw a lot of very inspiring sessions, and we took that multiple intelligences quiz, right? Does everyone remember that? Okay. So I looked around my table and I see the results up there and it says interpersonal like 40 out of 40 and mine was like two out of 40. <laughs> and my logical and mathematical was like, I think I exceeded the charts on that. So, um, you know, this is going to be very analytical and I don't really have any like, <laughs> <laughs> I don't have any like metaphysical wisdom to impart to you right now and I apologize for that but I'm here I'll give them my best shot so anyway we're going to start out with a question and this is the question what are you working on right now what's that migration, migration? like a technical migration or like migrating across okay <laughs> I'm, I'm working on a different type of migration coming from the U.S. Anyone else have an answer? Change, yeah. Uh, Helen just gave us a great answer to this question. She's working on this experiment that's a big experiment and can potentially affect large change. Uh, so if you were to ask me this today, I would say, well, I'm working with companies, traditional point solution companies on service pivots, you know, offering a suite of solutions or whatever the case may be. Those things take a long time, typically. Uh, if you were to ask me, go back in time, ask 2003, Kat, what are you working on right now? I would say, I am resolving this ticket, right? So in 2003, if you had asked me that question, I would have given you a story of what I'm going to be doing for the next few hours, hopefully. Fingers crossed I can get a result in that time. If you ask me today, I'm talking about years-long transition. So these, I have these different time spans going on in my head. Has anyone ever seen this show? Yeah, and in fact, I, I was like, I wonder if people do watch this show or if that's like a weird thing that I'm watching clips of it. No, it's very popular. It wins its time slot every week, pretty much. So many of us have seen this show. The premise is that the CEO or something like that goes and works with frontline workers who interact with customers or whatever the case may be. So, well, foreshadowing obviously we get this weird time span mashup that happens there why do we love this show they do come up with these really fantastic disguises for the senior leaders yes very convincing my favorite is the, the wiener schnitzel one like, what is it what is happening <laughs> yeah I feel like yeah, that's some sort of punishment, I don't know. Uh, but 
there's a lot of, we love this tension and the drama, right? That the, the senior leader, the CEO, the undercover boss has no idea how to do these frontline tasks. Yes? So it's some very cringeworthy stuff. And we also get these, these emotional stories of what the frontline workers have gone through or what the CEO has gone through. But what, at the end of each show, what we're left really understanding is that right now means something different to all the different people. So quite often the CEO will be saying, why are you doing that that way? I don't understand, right? Because the CEO knows the direction for the company and sometimes the actions of those frontline workers, they, they don't understand how those two relate. And other times we see the opposite of that, like there's some where the store managers are doing these things acting on a directive that they've received, a strategic directive. So we get a, a good uh, mix of the two ends of this time span spectrum. So I've had to think about that a lot in the work that I do where I'm trying to affect this large scale change over a very long period of time. Like when we're talking about these uh, service pivots, we're talking about a long time, right? Because this is something that CEOs are hoping to prepare for when Gen X is reaching the end of their careers or things like this, right? So it's a long time span. This guy's work, Elliot Jacques, he, he went into companies and measured these things. So it's not some guy who went in and was like, just, boy, I don't know, looks like we got this. He scientifically studied these companies and he started to learn about the different time horizons that people think in when they're doing their work. And these are the time horizons that he kind of saw clumping together. So you don't have to, I know it's small type, so I'll read it out to you, but there are people who think when you ask them what are you working on right now they'll give you an answer that's one day to three months and those are folks who are on the front lines of the organization and really executing on things then you get one level up from that that's up to a year so probably the longest thing i'm working on is a year-long project or initiative something of that sort and on and on and on two years five years ten years twenty years and then we get into this wild stuff that may not even exist in every company, which is 50 years, 50 plus years. So maybe some of you who do work in government, you are having to think about demographic changes 50 plus years, but there's just not a lot of people who have to think of those things. So it really is lonely at the top. A lot of you are looking at me like, yeah, so what? I already know this. Right? Like, I would expect someone who's working on tickets to be thinking in a shorter time horizon than the CEO. The thing is, just like we heard yesterday from Tracy, stories are, are how we affect change. And there's something very strange about the stories that we tell. So we think in these different time horizons, very different time horizons, but we tell stories that boil down to the same amount of time. If I go to tell you my story, it's an elevator pitch basically, right? I'll tell you a 15 minute story and it doesn't matter if I'm talking about a 50 year time horizon for change or a three month time horizon for change. As people, we have these archetypes for stories and we boil it down to roughly the same amount of time. That means that we have to sensitize ourselves to hearing that we're we're conversing with someone who's in a different time horizon from us. Because if I tell you a 50 year story and you're thinking of a three month story, right away we're introducing friction into our exchange, right? So there's going to be a lot of resistance if I say I'm working on a three month thing, I just want to get it done, and you're trying to tell me about a 20 year thing, and I don't understand how they relate. Uh, so, in case you didn't notice, the name of this session is not Exchanging Stories. It's not what we're here to talk about. We're here to talk about change. Although, maybe it should be Exchanging Stories. I'm not sure. I'd have to talk to Tracy more. But anyway, uh, there's a word in this title that I don't like. And lots of people don't like. That's why we're here, right? <laughs> it's the word change. I don't like the word change. I bet you all could have guessed that during my disclaimer, right? Someone very analytical. I'm not super psyched about that. 
but I think there's a difference between change and making something happen. I had a really interesting conversation over at lunch yesterday with someone who was like, I just want to work with people who are making things happen. I just want to work with doers. If I'm a person who thinks I work on initiatives that are five years long, I can be making something happen, but to the perspective of someone who's working on something that takes a week, I'm not doing anything, right? So there's a couple things here. One, maybe as we enter into conversations, we should try to have a little more empathy. And if you're like me, you have to train yourself to have empathy. So we can train ourselves to have empathy and think, are we just talking about two different things here? Let's assume everyone wants to get something done, but we're thinking about getting different things done, or we're thinking at different time horizons. Then the other thing that's interesting there is when I'm working on getting something done, am I changing? Am I part of a transformation? Not my own head, I'm just like, I'm just doing the thing, I'm just doing my work, right? I, I get this all the time that people will say to me, I just want to do my work. I don't care about this digital transformation, I don't care about this agile transformation, I don't care about any of those things, I just want to do my work. But your work is part of that transformation, right? We're just in these kind of like nested sets of stories. So I think the way that we might need to start thinking about change is what do you want right now? My goal is this. My goal, you know, uh, Helen's goal is to make these matchups between people who have the right skills and the jobs that need these skills. That's her goal. So she's going to, right now, she needs a group of people that she can allocate to these different things and they need to be able to, uh, you know, read through the information, all these things. So I need this right now. I think that's a better way to think about change. I'm not by far the first person who has thought of this. It's a thing called idealized design, and we'll talk about it more. But the other way to think about it is not necessarily what I need right now, but what I want right now in order to achieve my goal. And I love this quote from the book about idealized design. Uh, Desire must replace existence as a criterion for choice. So that's why I think it's important to ask, what do I want right now in order to achieve my goal? Not what currently exists. Like, I know we, we have talked about blockchain a couple times over the past couple days, and that's one of my favorite examples right now. You meet these executives who are like, I think I need a blockchain. And I'm like, <laughs> Bro, what? You want a really slow database to do what now? Like, right? So it's more important to say, in the context of my goal, I want to do this, right? Not, I, I, can, I see a blockchain sitting there and I'm going to put some links on, right? So effective stories that affect change, I have found they are constructed by asking, what do I desire right now? In order for me to do my job, what do I desire right now? And each of us will answer that in a very different time horizon. Yes? And that gets to my second point. Um, just really quickly, when you see this color combination, this is something that I stole from a really smart guy called Don Reinertsen, and he said, when you want people to look up and see something, you should make it as hideous as possible. So that's why, <laughs> in, case, in case you're wondering, also like the visual, like artsy score on my multiple intelligence is also quite low. So <laughs> yeah, uh, second point here is about about the difference between planning and speculation. So there's this great book, The Art of Action, and this is built on a very long history. It sounds like some of you have read it, but a very long history of um, military theory and all of these things. What happened was in World War I, we had these different ways of communicating, where communication got closer to being real time. So that opened up <laughs> a very different way of managing warfare, right? So we used to create these long plans and all the generals get together, they make these plans. I assume they're wearing like the tights and the puffy pants. 
and then they go hand it out to all their people and the people go and they execute on the plan and the people they they have to stand shoulder to shoulder because that's how information travels you like can't get so far away from someone that you can't just shout out what you're going to do next so that's what all the funny pictures are about when you see old warfare then we get this new type of communication that allows us to command closer to real time command in the right now so you'd say my goal is to do this so I, I what I need right now is for you to take that hill so we can block off whatever routes for resupplying right but in that case you are only commanding what you can see in your right now right now I can see that if I cut off supply for this group I would win this battle but at a larger scale, we're thinking about different strategies, right? But in each case, we are commanding for our right now, not speculating. So when we want to tell these stories that affect change, we need to distinguish between planning and speculation. Planning is I come up with a plan. I know what I want right now in order for me to achieve my goal in my version of right now. Speculation is... I think banks are going to the blockchain, so I think we should get a group together that does that, right? Planning would say, I need to have a really secure way to store this type of information, and I think blockchain is the thing that does that, right? So this is how it goes then. Yes, we go to the CEO, and the CEO says, I wish I had X right now. And then what happens? Uh, this has happened to all of you, right? You've all been doing an all hands meeting or something like that, yes? Yeah, and I go in and I'm gonna need this from you. Yeah, right on. Everyone gets a t-shirt, maybe they shoot them out with that cool gun, I don't know. I don't know where you work. Uh, <laughs> but we walk out, we walk out of that all hands meeting and everyone is like, you got it, okay, sure, uh-huh. Whatever, can I leave now, right? That's not stories. That's not conversation. That's not going to affect any change. So what do we do? Should we just ask every person at every level of the organization, what do you want right now? We could. <laughs> that is a thing you could do, I suppose. I would love to be there if you're going to do that. That'd be very interesting. But I think you would end up with something like this. People just heading in every different direction, and what do I want? Well, I want to figure out a way that I, I've literally done this before, so I'm going to use myself as an example. I want to figure out a way that I can automate away my own job. I'm not going to tell anyone. I'm just going to do other stuff in my free time. I was there for like a year and a half. No one even noticed. All right, so now you know that I'm a terrible employee and why I work for myself. But anyway, we'd end up with this, right? Everyone going in all these different directions. So Russell Acoff said this wonderful thing. Yeah, many of us have seen this before, right? The righter we do the wrong thing, the wronger we become. So how many of our change initiatives are about doing the thing righter? We have these quality initiatives, do the thing righter. Which thing? Which thing again? Just all the things? <laughs> sure, yeah, let's do that. Right on, sounds great. So what we really need is this nested system of what do you want right now? So um, you can't really see at the contrast on here, but I tried to, again, not a visual person, but I tried to like put a border around the outside to show like at the executive level, you also need to be basically a slave to the market and, and what are people actually going to buy and purchase and all that stuff. So we have these nested stories. Hopefully they start with the person who has this long time horizon, right? And say, I want this right now. And then there's a conversation that happens. They tell the next person, I want this right now, I think these things, and that person says, okay, well, I've seen this in my interactions, and so it might change your plan a little bit, and on and on and on, right? And we have this constant, uh, Dave Gray showed that 
what is the, um, the org chart of the future going to look like. And it's kind of just all these cool, like self-similar branches of feedback loops or something like that. Very nerdy, I enjoyed it very much. So we have these nested stories all the way down and we call that the Y stack. Has anyone heard the phrase popping the Y stack? So I should be able to go to anyone in an organization and say, why, what are you up to? And they tell me, oh, I'm working on this. Cool, why are you doing that? Well, because we want to do this. Why do you want to do that? Because we want to do this, right? And we should be able to go all the way back to strategy. Who works a place where you can do that? Raise your hands, it's okay. Oh, okay. Cool, right on. Uh, how big are the organizations that you work in? <laughs> I just see this happening. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so the larger the organization gets, the harder it is to do this, to pop the Y stack, right? We, I think we have some people representing some very large organizations in this room. Yesterday, someone shouted out 80,000 people and another person shouted out 250,000 people, something like that. Uh, so the harder it gets, the bigger the organization gets, the harder it is to pop this Y stack. The bigger the organization gets, the harder it is to even build this Y stack. Yes? It's incredibly difficult. How do we do it effectively? Through stories. And I, I feel like if I am telling you that, like I'm the queen of data, if I'm telling you that, <laughs> that you should try to do this through stories, that means there is literally no other way. I've tried them all. <laughs> Nothing. So obviously me being me, I've tracked which stories actually made anything happen. And they included these bits. I'm not saying this is like the right thing, but when I started doing more and more research into this, when I came to my unhappy place of knowing that we were gonna have to go with stories, these things came up over and over again in my research and then in my actual work. So I'll post these slides, just like a lot of words. Um, this is kind of like the translation of them. So there's the intent. What I actually want to do or what I want right now, there's the reason for change. And the way that I have found is quite effective to frame the reason for change is to say, if we changed nothing today, our future would look like this. So Obviously, you, you don't live in a static system, things will change, but that framing is what I have found to be most effective. Um, current state, like people will generally know what the current state is, so the purpose of this is like not to educate them, but it, we work in these complex systems and complex systems contain their history, right? So the, the inputs are also the outputs. Uh, so, with that in mind, we are just trying to check with people, my understanding of the current state is this, and I think these factors are most critical for us going forward. So right there, I'm not trying to educate anyone else on what's going on in the current state. They know, I'm trying to tell them, this is what I think the most important factors are in the current state. Uh, then, we talk about rules, routines, and constraints. So there's a big body of research, not, I mean, like, if you're a huge nerd, there's a big body of research on rules and routines and how routines, as they ossify, they, the perception is they turn into rules. So in our story, especially if you're a manager or something like that, it's important to say, I acknowledge you have this routine. It's not actually a rule. If you need to change it or whatever the case may be, I think that should be part of how you define your playing field. And then you should point out the actual rules, like that is more important than you might think initially. Uh, and then constraints. So if there's anything that's not a rule or a routine but we need to work within it, so look, the facts are demographics look like this, or the facts are we want to acknowledge that, or we have this budget, or whatever the case may be. So 
And those things are helpful in framing your playing field. Uh, then I usually use like a GPS metaphor to explain the story, but I'm not going to make you sit through that. Uh, but it is important for you to have leading indicators. So when you are looking at directions on your phone and you turn, have you ever t made the wrong turn and it takes you like five minutes before the phone is like rerouting? And I'm like, thanks, I'm already on the freeway, <laughs> right? Very frustrating. So we want leading indicators that are really close to our route so that we don't get on the wrong freeway exit and head 10 miles in the wrong direction before we know wrong route. Okay, so we want to come up with these leading indicators. An interesting thing here that was extremely disappointing for me is that the leading indicators are not always metrics. Unfortunately, they could also be stories that you might hear around the water cooler. This is something, <laughs> this is something that I have observed uh, that you go to the water cooler and you hear someone saying like, oh, this is never gonna work and here's why, or today was a terrible day and here's why. And I'm like, oh man, I wrote that strategy. It does suck, <laughs> right? But you can, if you ask people for stories rather than metrics when you're trying to generate the strategy or the big story, uh, it's much easier easier for them to come up with the leading indicators in terms of stories, like what would you hear from your direct report? So maybe you can come up with metrics afterwards. That's what I do. Uh, and then a rallying cry or an episode name. So uh, has anyone seen the pretzels episode of Seinfeld? These pretzels are making me thirsty, right? And then I've been told there's a hairbrush episode of Friends, and that's seen Friends. And then the Darmok episode of Star Trek. Where are my nerds at? Anyone? Uh-huh, yeah. So we want to be able to boil the, these things down into a key phrase that can trigger people when they are in the moment making decisions. Oh, I remember, this is the pretzels episode. I don't want to get too thirsty, right? So for each of these stories, we should actually lead them up, not with what I want right now, but given our goal is this, I want to do this other thing right now. And that's how we get that nesting effect. Yes? As you are creating these stories and hearing these stories, watch out for err. That's like the number one red flag for me is err. Faster horse. Right? Then. I guess it's hypocritical, I don't know, but they always say that Ford said, if I had asked people what they want, they would have said a faster horse. Right? If you ask Elon Musk what we want, what would he say? A more efficient car? So given, we have these nested givens, and it's all beautiful, and it lines up in this very cute stack. It's a rainbow. I think this is a double whammy because it is Pride Month, but also I had to like have some way to group them together. Uh, it never looks like that. That's not how it happens in real life. This has been my experience. Looks good, right? Nice, easy to follow, those stories natural progression. So I, I have a colleague that I work with quite frequently who's a very gifted designer and, and I'm sure many of you have seen her work somewhere. Uh, and I've worked on so many different versions of this with her and she said, there's no good way to display it. And I'm like, you've lived it. There's no good way to live it. Of course there's no good way to display it. What are you, crazy? But that's not a bad thing. Because of this, anyone familiar with this? Ashby's Law of Requisite Variety. Basically what it says is if we want to serve a complex world in our organization, we must also be complex. So if we have that hot mess of stories, that's actually good because it is reflecting our real world. It's helping us make sense of our real world and helping us get closer to the needs of the customer. So now we have this image, which you now all hate, right? Because it's not anywhere near the real world of the, of the nested givens, 
yes? And we know about the Y stack. And it always looks like this, right? And in this show, every person, the boss comes in, how do you like working here? I like it very much, sir. Oh, what are you working on right now? I'm working on fulfilling your strategy to do this, yes? <laughs> it's every episode. No, this is what happens in practice, yes? And this is actually the shape that I see most frequently, is there's a very high level strategy, like 20 years or something like that, that's created by maybe the CEO and the COO or something like that. And then the folks who are nearest to customers, they also have a plan for what am I going to change right now in order to get these customers to stop yelling at me. And then there's just this huge gap in the middle that's like, I'm trying to optimize TPS reports, <laughs> right? And that's terrible, right? Like we're basically ignoring the humanity of like this huge chunk of our organization by denying them these stories. And there's, but I mean, there's lots of other ways that uh, this is another common shape that I see where again, uh, right at the front lines, we know I wanna do this right now so people will stop yelling at me and then Maybe we get to this kind of like innovation layer where you have like a, a CTO and an HR executive who are cool and we hired them from Google or startup or something, right? And they have a strategy, except for the C-level leadership and the board is just kind of like, we have an earnings report coming out. Is that a strategy? Right, so this is the other shape that I see frequently. And it is just real life, so I think that we should reflect it. Yeah? So I have called this the Y gap. We have the Y stack and we have the Y gap. And you can detect it pretty easily. You start to hear things like this, like, I don't understand why they were asking me about X when Y had to get done right now. Who cares about something that's due six months from now, right? Or you hear this, why don't they just tell me what to do? Yeah? Someone, someone been there, done that? Yeah. People aren't motivated. They're not doing anything. They're just hiding out. In my case, that was actually true, but let's not talk about that. So again, we'll go back to the art of action, Stephen Bungay. So we can detect this why gap when there's top level frustration and lower level confusion. So at the top level, we're saying like, why won't they just do something? Anything is better than nothing. And at the bottom, they're saying, why won't they just tell me what to do? Yes? So that's how we can detect that we have this Y gap. Uh, how do we get rid of the Y gap? We remember that that given can start from anywhere. Has anyone read The Phoenix Project? Or The Goal, or listened to Beyond the Goal, on and on and on and on, right? In those books, we have examples of where people go to their leader and say, I believe your goal is X. If your goal is X, I should do, I, sh I want Y right now so I can do my job more effectively and help you achieve your goal. So we, we can start to construct that Y stack from anywhere. And it will be very messy. And you'll realize as you're constructing that story that you don't just need your manager and your direct reports on board. You also need this person over here. And you need this person over here. And that's why you have those overlapping, like uh, shaded circles and all of those things, right? But constructing that Y stack will at least begin to give us a map of the goals within our organization. So the Y gaps, uh, not only are they inhumane to have people just working without a purpose, but also it gives this place for this really dangerous ambiguity to breed. When do people resist change? They resist change, I think, for a couple of different reasons. One, if they have information about why that change won't stick or won't work, which is quite valid. And then the other one is when that change is articulated as a change instead of just something that makes you think, oh, I know, I need to do this now. 
right? So if that, if there's too big of a gap between my time horizon and the time horizon of the change that's being articulated to me, I will resist. That is a natural thing to do. People shouldn't be punished for that, right? So when a change is bigger than your now, that's when we perceive it as a change rather than just a catalyst for action. So we construct this Y stack, everything's good now, yes? There's someone really snarky over here. I, I don't know who it is, but I like it anyway. <laughs> you don't construct this just one time, right? You're in this living, dynamic organization. You don't construct it one time. So there's this great quote from the book, Playing to Win, which is an interesting book. Uh, but so companies should see strategy as a process, not as a result. So constantly we're refreshing that strategy. And as you get new information, build it into the strategy. I think that we should view organizational change as the same thing. So a company that I worked with, um, they had this idea of um, like transition states. So we, we want to do this long term. We think that this transition state in this type of the organization will move us a bit closer to that. Here's our leading indicators. They were willing to get new information from that transition state and change both their strategy and their future transition states. So they knew it was going to be a continuous thing. They got rid of the words reorg. That's not a thing anymore. It's just that we are moving around to where the work exists, where the people are. That's the normal thing to do. The outside world is not static. If we create a static environment inside, we will never be able to serve the needs of the outside world, right? So get rid of transformation. We're now talking about transitions. And if you want to learn more about that, uh, my colleague and good friend, Jay Bloom, is currently working on a, a PhD at Carnegie Mellon in that. So you can like look up his stuff. But anyway, uh, so now we have these nested stories, but we know that they're a hot mess like this. And we know that we're going to have to coordinate with stakeholders and with partners all over the organization. Now what we want to be careful not to do is eliminate organizational antibodies. So yesterday, a couple of the speakers talked about how you get naysayers, how maybe you want to try to win them over, or um, maybe you want to be careful to listen to them. That's my feeling. Those people are an important source of feedback for you because one, if they're a loud naysayer, they can help you understand where a Y gap exists. If you eliminate that, no Y gap exists, then you know that this person has a legitimate issue with whatever you're proposing, whatever you say that is your goal right now. So we don't want to eliminate those organizational antibodies. I went into an organization that was wildly successful. I was basically like, why am I here? Why are you, where is the problem? There's hordes of money everywhere, it's like, that's good, right? But this was their problem. They were trying to eliminate the organizational antibodies who were saying, we have a long history. We know some of the things that are core to our business that keep the lights on that shouldn't be changed, and we're not Netflix, and we shouldn't be, right? So that feedback is actually important. Those people can help you understand what is part of core business, what should be protected and potentially be a source for innovation, but not necessarily disrupted. So uh, back to this quote, because these those naysayers can help you know when it's when you are doing the wrong thing writer. Yes, they can give you some of that feedback, even if they can't clearly articulate it. Those naysayers can be very valuable. Anyone familiar with that? The first agricultural revolution? Hot topic of conversation at all the parties I go to. <laughs> so this happened over the course of thousands of years. There was not a CEO who's like, and now we are embarking on our first agricultural revolution. You'll all be much better and uh, much healthier at the end. That wasn't a thing, right? 
and I have some news for you. I don't know how you're going to feel about it, but we don't know what revolution we're a part of right now. It's not the electric car revolution. It's not the blockchain revolution. It's not, those things can only be seen in retrospect, right? Someone talked about the adoption of the smartphone. I had that conversation with my mom the other day. She goes, oh, I'm gonna go camping, but I can't go camping in the spot that I want because I don't get cell phone reception. And we went camping my whole childhood without a cell phone. One time we almost got swept away by a river. We didn't pick up, like, there was no car phone in our truck. To be, no, that's not a thing that happened, Mom. Right? But now it's fundamentally shifted the way, and we have no idea. We just did that because, oh, yeah, if I have this right now, I can communicate with other people in the way that I need to. I can access the things that I want in the way that I need to. But no one was like, Ah, yes, we're architecting this revolution that will be this, and soon we'll have chips in our brains, right? Like, no one knows how this is going to end up. So the question I think we need to ask ourselves as we embark upon change is, are we seeking the revolution, or are we trying to make a faster horse? If you are quoting people who are reinforcing existing power structures and saying we should do the same thing we're doing today but faster, cheaper, cleaner. That's a faster horse. So the thing that we should ask ourselves as you're coming up with those stories, you should be sensitized to this question. Am I starting a revolution or am I inventing a faster horse? Faster horse is not always bad. You might actually need a faster horse but you should be conscious of the decision that you're making. And I'm going to close by showing you this just because I promised my five-year-old son that I would. Uh, he made this, I don't even know what it's supposed to signify. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> I'm good on time, right? All right, keep it going for Kat. And on that illustration, uh, I believe we have lunch. Again, I have not heard, seen any actual evidence of lunch, so uh, don't take my word for it. Go out there and investigate for yourselves.